Welcome to this month's installment of Brass Chats, brought to you by Monster Oil. What is this? 21 year? Hi everybody, welcome once again to Brass Chats. This month's guest is a perfect storm of monster coincidences. He received his Bachelor of Arts from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, which is where Chris is from. He played in the Chicago Civic Orchestra in 2001 and 2002, which Tom also did at the same time. And as if that wasn't enough, he uh, was born in Washington, D.C., which is where I grew up. Uh, he's been principal tuba of the Boston Symphony Orchestra since 2003, which is 12 years for uh, all you math lovers out there. And he teaches at the New England Conservatory and Boston University and well-versed in pretty much any style of music one can make with uh, low, low noises. Mr. Mike Roylance, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Yeah, great to have you. Um, thanks very much for your time. We're really happy to be here. Let's start with what everybody's probably thinking, but nobody ever says. Why tuba? I was two weeks late for band. And they didn't have a tuba player? They didn't have a tuba player. Okay, what were your first notes like? Well, every note was a pearl. Yeah. Yeah. Every single time. Every single time. No comes out. That's success for that day. It, it, essentially, yeah. Oh, man. I feel the same way. Yeah. All right. So what's a typical day for Mike Roylance these days? Uh, my three kids are getting up around 6.30 and diaper changes, get the two older girls ready for school, get taken to school, go in to uh, drop them off and then head down to Symphony Hall and, and start doing my routine. All right. What's your routine like? if you'll share it with the uh, world. It's kind of top secret, but uh, it's, it's basically just all the brass fundamentals from, from uh, uh, buzzing, free buzzing, mouthpiece buzzing, to uh, lip slurs, long tones, usual stuff. Sure, how long does it take you? Uh, about, about an hour. About an hour for your yeah. daily routine. Yeah. And that's before you start working on any etudes or practice or, or anything solos, like that. yes, or my Grammy record or whatever. Okay, right, yeah. sure. But this, you're on your 13th Grammy now, right? 14th. 14th, okay, Thanks I'm sorry, lot. pardon. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so talk about some of your musical influences. Um, you, you started out, right, what, what year were you uh, when you started playing tuba? Well, I was 10 years old. 10 years old, yeah. so fifth grade, two yeah. weeks late to the first day of band. Um, and then, I assume that after you got past the every note is a pearl stage, you started listening to tuba or musical influence, anything like that. Talk about some of that. What inspired you? Um, my, my first influences in playing the tuba had nothing to do with tuba. I, I wasn't exposed to a lot of great tuba players early on. I, I had some great band directors in Florida, uh, John Garecki at Millwee Middle School, I don't remember Millwee, and uh, then Don Schmaus at Lyman High School. and Primarily, I was influenced by jazz musicians early on, uh, trombone players like Irby Green and and J. J. Johnson, and then uh, uh, I mean Clark Terry just passed, but he was a great influence back then. And, and uh, but he, my band director was a trumpet player, and so I was clearly influenced by trumpet players for a long time. So I, he 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 uh, asked me to to play the electric bass in the jazz band, so I started doing that early on, and. And that definitely put me in that direction. And, and you know, whenever I was listening to music, it was you know the great you know Maynard Ferguson band or Count Basie or the Louis, you know Louis Belson or all those guys. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so jazz came first, maybe before being an expert at the tuba. Yeah, I, I started on piano when I was five or six. You know, and did did that for about about I don't know six or seven years, and be you know, up through some early Mozart kind of things. So yeah. classical music was always there. It was definitely the foundation, and then and then I kind of got into that, and then there was always the high school uh, garage rock bands that I was playing in too. So sure, on electric bass. On electric bass. Okay, yeah. very cool. So you, I mean, as I mentioned before, you're a guy with a, a giant musical background in terms of versatility, and I want to uh, speak to that. Um, a little bit. You had in a phrase. You've done it all. You did the Disney Future Core. Uh, you've done brass ensemble and pet band stuff at Rollins. You taught there. Um, uh, Dixieland jazz, big band, Broadway shows, chamber, just, you know, you name it. How have you benefited from so many different genres? Um, I, I, I guess just from the, all the experiences of, of the different genres, I, I, I have a, a really, really vast library of, of, uh, of styles and, and experiences to draw upon it. And when, when I, you know, uh, when, I, when I'm playing with the BSO, it's some, some of this stuff may be appropriate, some of this stuff may not. When I'm playing with the Boston Pops, some of it may or may not. I, I guess they all, I've just benefited by having an extremely large resource of, of material to draw from. Every time I play a note, whether it's a long 
you know, big big whole note, or, or if it's a passage that I'm playing melodic material in. So. Yeah, and that informs all styles that you're yes, that you're playing. Yes, abso absolutely. A everything that you hear all day long will influence you. Sure, that's a good tool to have, and it's not. Kind of sounds like um, that. That gets me into my next question, really. We sound kind of similar, I think, in how we sort of developed. I don't know if you had a moment where, uh, where you said, okay, that's my light switch. I'm going to be a professional tuba player. Because from what you have just been saying, you did the high school garage band kind of stuff. You played you know, electric bass in, in the jazz band. I played drums in my jazz band. I'm a trumpet player. So you, know, you just kind of get everything you can, and you just keep gravitating towards these ensembles and it becomes more than a hobby. Would you say that's how it happened for you or did you have one of those light switch moments where it's, I'm going to be a tuba player? No, I, I'm still waiting for that light switch to happen. I, I, uh, I, I was not going to be a professional musician. I, I, I really didn't understand the career path and, until I had my first private teacher um, and he uh, kind of really showed me a lot of options that I wasn't really even aware of. And e even up until my first job at Disney, I was essentially going in the direction of like a pre-law degree because both my parents were in law and that's what I was going to do and and I was just going to do the Disney thing for a couple of years and that and it morphed into the 13 14 years there and then so and then I then we were laid off at Disney and I might very well still be there if we weren't laid off and, and so I was at a a crossroads of, of uh, what am I going to do you know tuba wise there's not that many options you know that for every orchestra that has four trumpet spots there's only one tuba and uh, so it was either completely go all in, move to a new town and kind of retool from that commercial background to classical, um, or change careers completely. When I almost did the other one, which was becoming into the aviation industry because I'm really into flying. And, and uh, fortunately, I got steered to Chicago where I met one of my greatest influences ever, Mr. Tom Brown. I was going to say, is it Tom Brown? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. He, yeah. Plays some, uh, he plays a little bit of electric bass too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's not as good as you. I haven't even heard you. There's no way. Um, but, okay, so I was talking about, you, you were talking about aviation a minute ago, um, and I had a quick question about that. Your bio says you're a pilot with an instrument rating. Yes. Now, insert dumb instrument joke here, tuba instrument, haha, -ha, get it. But seriously, what does, that, what does that even mean? What is an instrument rating? Uh, for a pilot, an instrument rating is, is allows them to fly in, in, in basically all kinds of weather. Whereas as a, a, a your basically newly minted pilot will have what's called a private pilot's license and they're allowed to fly in good weather. And so an in instrument uh, trains you to fly on instruments alone. So I can fly in the clouds without any reference to the ground. Cool. All right. So many people find that their favorite hobby outside of music really kind of cross pollinates their musical career or habits. Have you found the same thing with aviation? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I, a lot of people in aviation are into music. Um, maybe not to the level that, that you know, I'm, I'm currently in, but a lot of people, in, it, it, there's a lot of uh, similar type of brain activities into pilots and, and engineers and, and musicians. So yeah, it's definitely been. At what are you better now because you are a pilot, if anything? Staying awake. Oh, that's an important thing for a tuba player. <laughs> yeah. Well, All we're right. playing a piece tonight, actually, by Szymanowski that's a 90-minute a work, and I think I have a total of 17 notes. And so it's one of those type of works. But the mu music is beautiful. There's a full chorus and great soloist, you know, top-notch top soloist singing, and, and uh, Charles Dutrois is conducting. And, and, but I'm, uh, I'm sitting there enjoying this lush music. And it, you know, yeah, so, I, but in, in all seriousness, uh, I've definitely benefited from being a pilot because of the concentration level is, is so much more um, uh, single-mindedness. It, it, it enables me to have a much uh, more ac acute single-mindedness towards the task. So you were just talking about auditions a little bit. Yes. And uh, let's get into the nitty gritty of that. How, uh, how do you prepare for auditions typically? Or how do you encourage your students to prepare for auditions? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a long process. It's something to be taken very seriously. I, I know there's a thousand ways to prepare for auditions, and you know, mine is, is definitely very streamlined. And, and um, it's, it's about an eight-week process where you, where you sort of take every possible excerpt you're going to play um, and tear it apart and by playing things at half speed and, and slow, purposeful practicing you know, for a long time, about two weeks just living and wallowing in half speed land. And then slowly bringing things up to speed, and uh, 
and then using the last two or three weeks of, of, of preparation to just do mock auditions, basically. So that every day is a mock audition, and then when you finally arrive at the audition, it's, it's really just, it should feel like another mock audition. That's the goal. So the extra seasoning on audition day, obviously, is nerves. You treat the last two and three weeks like a mock audition, but obviously audition day is different. It's, you know, it's do or die time. Right. How have you personally, ha have you been affected by nerves in a performance or audition, and how do you deal with that kind of thing? Oh yeah. yeah, I've definitely been affected by nerves. I, I remember with the BS audition, there was one moment where the excerpt that was, they flipped the page and the next excerpt was the Wagner's Meister Singer Overture. You know, very standard excerpt for tuba players, kind of the first thing you learn. And I remember as I'm, I'm switching horns, I'm, I'm emptying out my slides, I'm turning the page, and, and this thought clear as a bell came into my head. The future of your unborn children depends on how well you play this next excerpt. I, and it was clear as a bell, I never had those kind of thoughts. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah occasionally they'll get a little nervous issue. And, and, and I, 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 you know, I, I, I've read a lot of books. Don, Don Green's audition prep books are great. And you yeah. know, one, of, one of the tools they learn is just to accept fear a, a, as, a, as, a, as an energy and, and to turn that around into to a, a positive, you know, just accept it and turn it around into a positive energy into what you're doing at the moment. So what happened on the Meistersinger excerpt? Nailed the it. future of your unborn children, you nailed it? They're thriving. Good for you. Yeah. Nice work. All right. So, how many auditions did you take before your uh, your BSO appointment? Um, uh, five or six. Five or six. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. find that you got a little bit better at each each one? I mean, speak to lots of people say auditions are um, kind of a game in themselves in terms of how you approach them, and you get better at auditioning. Did you find that was true for you? Yeah, absolutely. Every audition was, was when you leave an audition, you, you carry all that experience into the next audition. So you're always in an advantage, but that doesn't mean you're going to succeed at every audition. I mean, I, I've had auditions you know, right out of the block where I made it to the finals, and then the next audition I didn't advance out of the prelims. Uh, one Marine Band audition I made it to the finals, the next one I didn't advance. So, yeah, it, but the only way to get better at auditions is to, to, to do them. So how do you deal with that? You make finals, next one you don't advance. At, how do you parse out the, I'm not as good, I'm not worth being here? Because I think that's something that, I mean, I, I certainly had that when I had the same, same experience, you know. I don't deserve that last time I advanced was luck. And this is not just applicable to, you know, auditions. It could be anything. You could be in seventh grade, have a just bangerang concert the last time, and right. tomorrow's you're going to, you know, totally flop. So how do you deal with that as a performer? Yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one. It's hard to not take it personal, but you ha you have to realize that, you know, if if you're having success at auditions, one aspect is that it's apples and oranges. When it comes down to the finals, it's everybody is capable of playing the position, and they have to find the right sound and the right style of player that fits their particular band or, or orchestra. And um, so, I, I, yeah, perseverance. It's it's tough. You just have to. You have to press on and, and realize, you know, in, in a, in a non-narcissistic trumpet view, you have to look at it as, as it's, it's their loss. It's their loss. And then just move on to the next situation. That's a good attitude. That's terrible. Isn't that terrible? That's, it it, it kind of is, but in a way it's liberating because if you <laughs> well, you know, yeah, thank you for that. But, you know, it's, it's liberating if you... If you do the best you can do. Am I do. fired? Did I get fired? <laughs> You're fired from the monster interview. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your time, yeah. Mike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of liberating because then it's not your fault anymore. Even if you play your best, sometimes you're just not the right person for the job. I think the best advice I ever got was from Jeeper Corny, who's the tuba, tubist in Chicago Symphony. And he said, never go to an audition to win it, ever. He said, there's, there's too much baggage, too much weight on you. So always go to be the best, the best player there. And that's it. And, if, and then they can't justify looking anywhere else. And, and uh, that was, it, it's hard. It's really hard to separate yourself from really wanting it. You know, I remember my dad lived in Seattle and I, I really, really wanted to win the Seattle Symphony job to be there, but, but I, I didn't advance out of the prelims. So, <sighs> yeah, but that, things worked out. So. Yeah, of course they did. It's commonly said that each orchestra around the world has uh, a different identity, you know, maybe manifested through the style in which they, you know, play things. Um, sometimes shaped by their hall, sometimes shaped by the sound of their brass section. What are, uh, to you, some of the signature characteristics of the sound of the Boston Symphony Orchestra? 
Um, well, the Boston Sin Symphony has a fascinating history where um, at the turn of the 1900s, they were essentially a German orchestra. And then during the wars, they, they uh, exported. <laughs> they forced a lot of the German citizens to leave the country. And, and then uh, the orchestra became primarily a French orchestra. And so it, it's fascinating when we play Ravel's music or, 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 um, or Debussy, uh, I, 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 that if there's one personal, personality trait I put in this orchestra, is it, it, it's, it's incredibly lush. Um, and it's incredibly expressive. Um, the, the, all the principals in this orchestra, w whenever there's a moment for them to have a, even if it's a, a, a four beat solo or, or, or a two note solo or, or, or a 32 bar solo, it, it is as, it's, going, it's like going to school every time, listening to these people play. So it's, a, it's amazing. So what do you do every single day to make sure you're the best tuba player you can be? You mentioned earlier about doing an hour of fundamentals. Okay, so after that, you know, how do you structure your daily practice? Is it what you're working on that day? Is it what you got coming up in your concert? Speak to that a little bit. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, lo it's load based. It depends if I have a recital coming up or, or if, if the concert like tonight, you know, clearly I didn't have to put a lot of time into maintaining my, my chops for a range of a fifth, you know, that I'm playing 14 notes, um, like the Dvorak New World Symphony as well, you know, but you still have to main, every note has to be a pearl. You know, in, in a tubist, there's only one in an orchestra, so every note is a solo. And, and if, if you make a mistake, there's, you can't, you know, point it to your friend, you know. Um, yeah, I, it, it's load-based, and, and I think primarily it's, it's fundamentals. I'm always, I'm always, always, always trying to stay on top of my fundamentals, and I, I think that's the only way to kind of carry you through as, as you age. You studied with some of the greats, like Gene Picorni and Chester Schmitz. Um, tell me a funny or inspiring or scary or otherwise notable story from, from your time studying with them. Huh. Let's see. Well, I, I don't know if I can really share all this stuff with them. Or a great piece of advice, you know, a pearl of wisdom that you like to pass on to your students. It can be, it can be anything. Um. I don't know. You know, some some of the great things that, that I did with Gene um, at Symf at Orchestra Hall in Chicago. Um, he he really. I mean, this doesn't answer your question. I'm going to dodge your question. Uh, but, That's all right. But um, he 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 really taught me the value of placing uh, musical breaths, of making a breath a musical moment, and. Uh, I mean, there's, that, that's a concept that's really hard to grasp. You know, it has so much to do with how you massage the end of the note leading up to the breath and how you come in after the breath so that it, it, uh, it contributes versus takes away from the line. So, um, What was your biggest uh, breakthrough moment or time period on, uh, on tuba? Like For me, it was in college when I discovered that I should have been doing lip slurs since the day I picked up the horn. Ouch. What was it, what was it for you? Did you have one of those kind of things? Yeah, I, I, I had a... I had, Many moments that in my life. I mean, my my two years in Chicago was extremely influential in in, in uh, shaping my my tuba playing. I mean, I, I, I had a strong fundamental background for, even from back when I was in high school, and I marched in a drum and bugle corps called Suncoast Sound, and and I, I was fortunate to have some great great uh, pedagogical masters. And, and so, essentially, the fundamentals that I do now, I learned from these guys, Robert Smith and Frank Williams, back in the day. And I'm still doing them every day. And, and um, gosh, uh, I, 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 if there's one period of time that really, really locked in uh, 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 an immense amount of progress was Chicago. Because the, the influences there were, were, were bar none amazing. Oh, oh so one, one funny story about Chicago. This will, you'll appreciate this. So it had nothing to do with my teachers. But uh, the former um, president of the Chicago Symphony, was it Hen Henry Fogel or something like that? I'm sure you're going to edit that out and put in his name right. We'll just over, <laughs> <the>, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a deal. there was a, a fundraising event on Chicago Public Radio, and they do it every year with Chicago Symphony. And um, they had myself and, gosh, I guess you went, maybe you didn't, you went there? I don't remember. Yeah. It was me and somebody else that, that were, like, speaking on behalf of the Civic Orchestra. You know, it was, it was uh, everybody was calling in, raising funds, and, and, and uh, the president, I think his name was Henry Fogel, he, uh, Apologies if it's not, but uh, he uh, he he said he interviewed me. What so, Mike? What's it like to play on the stage of Orchestra Hall? And you know, it's, it's like the inner sanctum. I mean, it's it's amazing. You know, there's there's. So my answer was was essentially that. I said it's 
it's sacred ground to be able to play on this stage. I said, every time I, I, I empty my spit on a stage, it's, I just can't believe I'm here. And uh, anyway, I never, I never got called back to do any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was, you know, I was being honest. Yeah. What's the best advice you can give to a young musician thinking about making a career out of music? Hmm. Be hungry. Get, get tons of influences all the time and, and hear live music. You got to hear more live music than you hear recorded music. You just got to experience it. If, if there's a, an orchestra in town or a band and they're doing repeat performances, you got to go to every one. You just got to soak it up. It, it, there's no excuse to have your headphones in when there's somebody playing live music next door. And whether it be jazz, reggae, pop, you know, whatever, funk, it doesn't matter. If it's Yo-Yo Ma, it, it's all an influence and it's all going to be in there. And, um, and the other thing I would say is, is to, to really try to immerse yourself in the different styles of playing so that you're, you're, you, you don't have to be the world's master at Dixieland and the Ride of the Valkyries or anything like that, but you, you should be well versed enough in it so that if you ever get a call in, in any genre, you're comfortable saying yes, absolutely. Yeah, and don't be afraid to jump into the fire. That's the big one. Jump into the fire. It's okay. It's not that hot. Most people have a moment, sometimes a lot of moments, and we're really asking you to, to bear your soul here. Not everybody likes to answer this question. Oh God. Most people have a moment in their playing or concert careers that they wish they could have another shot at. So what's yours? What's your biggest frack, your biggest oops moment? The wheels totally fell off. I've never made a mistake in my life. Like I said, not everybody likes to answer that question. But OK, all right, that's fine. So. Go to some fan questions here. Yeah, uh, there, there was one moment. It, yeah, yeah. It, there was a, there was this piece that the BSO was playing. It was my during my probationary year. So, and, and it seemed it seemed to me like every week was a major tuba orchestral type of test piece. And um, but this one piece, it was a, it was a premiere of this this composer Thea Musgrave, and the one movement that I was featured in was something about sea monsters. You know, go figure, they use a tuba for that. And, and the part actually had, had me, it wrote it, it said in there, stand up and walk forward 10 feet, 10, 10 paces while playing the solo. There was a lot of pressure for a guy out of probation to do this. And, and um, anyway, I, I, I goofed and, I, you know, thankfully my, my many years of influence in the improvisatory years kind of got me through it. It wasn't, terrible but it was off but anyway I go downstairs and I remember our principal cello during intermission he goes what happened did you did you get lost and I just shrunk down and you know I was like but at that point I, up, up, up to that point I thought that nobody had even noticed and yeah <laughs> I just, just walked away shame two questions left in this in this segment and this one's kind of a serious one what are your thoughts on the disparity between the number of orchestral music students today and the number of jobs that exist now and in the future? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very real hard fact that there, there are not a lot of jobs. I think the odds of winning a tuba job are, are your, your greater job at being on an NBA basketball team than you have to playing tuba in a professional orchestra. Or, or, or and the other thing I heard was you're 10 times more likely to become a U.S. Senator, but you know, who would want to do that? So. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I have a lot of students at, at, between the schools I teach, and I, I don't think it's my right to discourage anybody from pursuing their dream. You know, I, I think music takes people to all sorts of, you know, places. I mean, you, look at you guys with this, this great company. And I, it, it, just because you, you spend your life studying music does not mean you're not going to have other interests. And, and you, those other interests may take priority for a certain time in their life, and, and they may not. I mean, you know, I, I, one question was asked the great tuba player Harvey Phillips at this master class years ago. It's almost the same question. You know, how, how can you justify sending all these kids through school you when know, there's no jobs? And, and uh, Harvey, without even you know, batting an eye, said, there's always going to be room at the top for great players. And that was it. And he's right. And, I, and everybody, everybody proceeds down the path of improvement at different rates. And you guys have probably all experienced that. You know, and, and you have, so you may not hit it when you're 22. You may, it may not hit it when you're 25. You know, I, I won the BSO when I was 33, I think, 34. And I, I, could, have been, I, I could have changed my career many times before that. But I, I kept doing it. So it's, it's, it's really just perseverance and, and uh, you, know, you can't give up if you want it. 
if you can pay the bills. All good-natured ribbing among the best of brass friends uh, aside, what's one thing you think trumpet players can do differently to make your job easier in general? Well, I don't know. I work with the best. And I really mean that. And all ribbing aside, but these, the people that I work with in the BSO on a regular basis are just amazing. I, I think, um, and, and the whole brass section. And I'm not just sucking up because I get a, you know, any, any favors or anything like that. It, it, it's really amazing. I think the biggest thing for all musicians, let alone trumpet players or, or any horn, is just that they're listening. And, and the moment is active. It's never a stagnant moment. You know, so that if, if you're playing a whole note and somebody's playing a whole note three octaves above you, you, you can sense when somebody's pushing a little you know, louder or softer. I mean, many times Tom Ross and I will talk after a show and, and I'll be like, hey, so I, I heard you going, just pushing a little bit more this time, or I heard you pull it back and I, I hung with you, or, or vice versa. And, you know, that's, that's the level of listening that needs to be involved all the time. Even, you know, and it doesn't matter if, it's, if, if we're playing Tannhäuser or if we're playing Stars and Stripes. Again, you really, really have to be in it. And one last question for the tuba nerds out there, because I know that There's everyone's. A few of them. Uh, oh yeah, a few. What'd uh, you call me? Uh, hey, come on, easy. Can we get security in here? Yeah. yeah um, said that. So just one question for the tuba nerds out there: What equipment do you play on right now, and why? Uh, I play on a, a, a tuba made by Walter Nerschel out of Germany. It's a copy of Arnold Jacobs's York tuba. It's a C tuba, six quarter C tuba, and I play. Uh, a, a, a mouthpiece by the name made by Scott Lasky, a 30H, gold plated with a European shank. Uh, I have a Rudy Meinl F tuba, and I also have a Mirafone Petrushka F tuba that I use quite a bit. And yeah, that's about it. All right, so it's that time again. We end every monster interview, uh, every Brass Chats interview, excuse me, with the monster round. Mr. Roy Lance, in the monster round, I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions that may or may not pertain to anything that you think we're here to talk about. Uh, and your job is to answer them uh, spur of the moment off the top of your head and, uh, and just roll with the punches. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Monster round, Mike Roy Lance, here we go. Favorite place to play the oh, tuba? Oh, God, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite place to play the tuba? Symphony Hall. Your first car? A 65 Corvair. Fastest time running a mile? Eight minutes. Favorite team in any sport? Uh, Packers. Name three of your favorite composers. Mm, Mahler, Wagner, and the team who composed the music for Rush. A oh, rock group. Nice. Uh, have you ever used a neti pot? I have. What did you think of it? I used it once. Yeah? Yeah. So that's what you thought of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what? What? Why? I, have I, you? I haven't. No. I, it's you been should. recommended to you me. Should. I okay. want to be there when you do it. Okay. Well, I'll come back to Boston. We'll be here. Okay. We're only two hours away. I'll come away. to you. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a date. <laughs> Favorite orchestral excerpt? For tuba? Sure. Uh, Favorite orchestral excerpt would be Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony. Okay. Well, since you went there, favorite orchestral excerpt for not tuba? Mm. I'll have to say the short call from the for the from French horns, the, the Strauss short call. Favorite plane to fly. Favorite plane to fly. Well, I haven't flown that many, but but right now it would be the uh, Piper Arrow. James Taylor or Randy Newman. Uh, I don't know. I, I work with James Taylor a lot. He's great, but the, the song "Short People." Come on. I mean, you got to give it to the man. That, okay. That's it. Least favorite orchestral excerpt. Dvorak New World Symphony. If you could have achieved the same level of accomplishment playing a different instrument than tuba, which one would it have been? Cello. What kind of bike do you have? You're an avid cyclist, right? Yeah, I have a Cannondale right now. Oh, nice, nice road bike. Yeah. Cool. What's the, uh, what's the furthest you've ever rode your Cannondale? Uh, I've done a couple centuries, so about, about, about 100 miles. Uh, what's the first piece of music that made you realize that music is what you want to do with your life? Uh, I, I, I haven't hit that yet. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. I, I'm, I'm living it, and I love it. It's great, but, but uh, music has always just been there, and I, I, it's, it's been a good friend. Mike Roy Lance, your knowledge is much appreciated. Yeah, my pleasure. And your time as well. Thank Thanks, you very Joel. much for being Thank with you. us. Thank you.